By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And as you can see, we are playing some multiplayer today. To be precise, we're playing Elder Dragon Highlander. Of course, old school style. Here you can see the commanders that we are playing today. So I'm playing on the left top corner. My nickname here is Apprentice Wizard. But of course, you know me as Timmy. I'm playing with Uncle Istvan. Then my opponent, Sump Kongen, better known as Yoon. He's playing with Edun Oakenshield. And on the right bottom corner, we've got Cornhole, aka Ryan. And he's playing with Xida Adian. And then on his left side, we see Daniel, aka Free Range Chicken. And he's playing with Angus McKenzie. So we've got very interesting commanders. We've got very interesting decks. I mean, this is gonna, going to be a spectacular game. Now, before I start with the deck decks, I would just like to point out that um, you can find timestamps in the description below. And the reason I'm mentioning that is by using those timestamps, you can, for example, skip this introduction and go straight to the game itself um, by simply clicking on the timestamp called MTG Games. Uh, but you can also choose to kind of go to a specific deck deck. Maybe you're really curious about the Angus McKenzie deck of Free Range Chicken. Then you can choose Angus deck deck on the timestamp and you can go straight there. Another thing you can find in the description below is the rule set because maybe you're noticing that I'm the only player who's actually not playing with a summon legend and that is because we're using a different rule set here where you're actually allowed to choose from a limited amount of non-legendary creatures to kind of widen the choices and the variety in the decks in Commander Old School. Now obviously feel free to completely disagree with this. Maybe you're a purist and you wanted to stick with traditional Highlander with just with the legendary creatures. Go for it, man, absolutely fine. I guess the only thing that's important before you start with an EDH match or a Highlander match or whatever you wanna do is that you clarify what rule set you follow. And that's actually how I use rules. It's not like that one's better than the other. It's more, okay guys, what rule set are we gonna play? Are we all happy with that? And then we can start building and we can start setting up a game. That's all it's about for me. Okay, so that's it for the introduction. I'm now gonna start with the deck tech section of this video. I'm actually gonna start with my deck, Uncle Istvan's Day Out. Let's have a look. And here we see my deck. So I'm playing with Uncle Istvan. I've called it Uncle Istvan's Day Out. You know, Uncle Istvan doesn't like to go out, but in this day, he's forced to because there are opponents, there are other wizards, other commanders trying to invade his private space. So he's gonna defend himself, right? And Uncle Istvan is a one, three creature from the dark, three black and one, and it reads, all damage done to Uncle Istvan by creatures is reduced to zero, niente. And that means it's a really good blocker, but also if I can give it banding, and I am playing with Helm of Chatsuk, it could be really good in the offense. So I wanna combine Uncle Istvan, band it with a really big creature, like send your vampire, frozen shade, whatever, you know, attack with it, then my opponent wants to block, and I can put all the damage on Uncle Istvan. But of course, that's not the only trick I've got in this deck. I just have a lot of, little synergies and tricks, for example, Nettling Imp and Sorcerer's Queen, right? With Nettling Imp, I force them to attack. With Sorcerer's Queen, I make them O2 creatures and then I can probably kill it with one of my other creatures, maybe even with my Sanger Vampire and get, you know, kill a creature, get a bonus. It's, it's all good, you know? So there are a lot of these little tricks uh, in here. For example, um, I've got Health Caretaker combined with the Hive, right? The Hive I can use to make little 1-1 one, one giant wasp tokens. Health Caretaker, I can sack a creature, so I can sack one of those tokens to get a creature back from a graveyard. So I could get a lot of value that way. Um, another little sub theme here is I'm playing with um, Zombie Master and I'm also playing with quite a lot of zombies. And of course, Zombie Master is gonna give my other zombies Swamp Walk. And this can be quite relevant because I'm playing with Evil Presence and a couple of other ways to make sure that my opponent has swamps and I can then you know, have my zombies become unblockable and deal some damage that way. I also have some finishers in my deck or actually I plan them as finishers. So I've got, for example, a mirror universe, which will allow me to change when my life total is low with the highest life total at the table, that way making that person very vulnerable. I'm also playing with pestilence, which is a real finisher here. So pestilence uh, pay one black deals one damage to every player and every creature on the table, but it doesn't destroy itself when there are no more creatures. So Pestilence actually gets better the later we are in the game, if I can have a lot of life. So maybe there's a scenario where I can use my Mirror Universe, trade my really low life total for really high life total, then cast Pestilence, having a lot of swamps on the board, and then simply win the game on the spot. Because of course, the good thing about Pestilence is, 
One black mana will deal one damage to each of my opponents. So not to one of my opponents, no, to each of my opponents. So I think Pestilence, and myself, of course, but I just think Pestilence, especially in multiplayer, is just a really, really good card. Another card that I'm hoping to use as a finisher, I've done that before, is um, a Cormus Bell. So Cormus Bell is an artifact. It makes all swamps on the table 1-1 one, one creatures. And according to the current Oracle text, it makes them 1-1 one, one black creatures, right? So that is actually really good because I've got a Bad Moon as well. So if I've got a Bad Moon, a Cormus Bell, and I play the Cormus Bell late, I've got an army of 2-2 two, two creatures, and I can probably take out one or two opponents with that. So those are kind of my more finishing plans. But during the game, one of the things I want to do is just gain a lot of life with, for example, um, you know, I've got Soul Net, I've got um, another card that's going to give me life is Grave Diggers. With Grave Diggers, I can remove an artifact from anybody's graveyard and actually gain two life. I think that's a really good card. Um, and with that life gain, I've got uh, Throne of Bone. So I've got a couple of ways to gain life. And that's really important because it's going to buy me time. You know, this is going to be a really long game, so I just want to have a high life total. But also, it's going to make my card drawing um, cards better because I'm playing Book of Wrath, two life to draw a card, and I'm playing Greed, right? So if I can use Book of Wrath and Greed to cash in on that life to draw extra cards, that would just be phenomenal. If I can then combine it with Mirror Universe, right? So I'm just drawing tons of uh, cards that's going to cost me a lot of life, and then I'm going to change my life total with Mirror Universe. So there are just a lot of little tricks in this deck. Feel free to pause it and to kind of try to find all the little tricks that I've put in here because I just love card synergies, right? Um, but for now, I'm going to continue with the deck deck of my neighbor that is Yun. Let's take a look at this Adun Oakenshield Brew. And here we see the deck of Yuan, aka Sump Kangen. So he's playing with Adun Oakenshield as his commander. So that means he's playing with the colors black, uh, red, and green. And Adun Oakenshield is a summon a legend, a 1 2 creature. You can tap it for a black, uh, a red, and a green. And then you can select one creature from your graveyard and place it into your hand. So this is just great, you know, if you've got some kind of graveyard trick going on. I can already see several tricks. So first off, he's got quite a lot of cards that can make um, a little token. So then he can sacrifice a token to get back a good creature. For example, I see Serpent Generator, I see Breeding Pit, I see Boris Devil Boon. So, you know, so he's got these things in place. I also see that he's got some sack outlets, for example, um, Ashnot's Altar, so he can sack some creatures for, for mana, right? And then those creatures go to the graveyard and he can get them back with Adun Oakenshield. Um, another nice uh, trick here, I think, that kind of goes well with the sacrificing is a Life Chisel. So Life Chisel is pretty interesting. It's kind of like a budget version of Diamond Valley. So Diamond Valley is a card, right? A land from Arabian Nights, you can tap it, Sack a creature, you gain life equal to the toughness. Life Chisel is an artifact from Legends that does the same, but you can only use Life Chisel in your upkeep. It does have one thing that makes it slightly better than um, Diamond Valley, and a lot of things that makes it worse, but it's got one little unique thing, and that is that during your upkeep, you can sack as many creatures as you want to the Life Chisel, whereas with Diamond Valley, because you've got to tap it, you can only pick one creature. But... You know, that's something. So, for example, he could have a situation going where um, he could sack his Rook Egg to the Life Chisel, gain three life, then, of course, gain a 4-4 bird at the end of his turn, and then use Aiden Oakenshield to get the Egg back, and then he can do that same thing over and over and over again. The thing is, it's a very slow thing, right? It's going to take him a whole turn, and he needs enough mana to also and use the Aiden Oakenshield and to cast uh, the Rook Egg. So it's going to be seven mana. But it's not unthinkable. I mean... These games tend to take quite long, so I'm, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Um, another nice thing with all the token generators, by the way, is Fallen Angel. So I'm also playing with Fallen Angel myself. I think it's really good. It's a really good card. And if you can kind of uh, have enough tokens uh, to kind of feed to the Fallen Angel, remember it's also flying, even though it's lost its wings. It's kind of weird. But anyway, it flies still. Um, it can become huge, and it can just take a, an opponent out on the spot at the right moment. Um, talking about um, uh, c uh, cards and creatures that kind of benefit from that whole token story, uh, I also see that uh, that zombie from uh, Arabian Nights, uh, Gabal Ghoul, that's the name. And Gabal Ghoul is pretty cool because Gabal Ghoul has this weird thing going on that when you play it, it gets a plus one, plus one counter for every creature that previously died that turn. So it's really weird. So this card is already working when it's not even on the battlefield. So, for example, if um, you use... 
I don't know, Ashnot's altar to sacrifice uh, a token to the altar and you gain two, uh, two mana, then a creature has died that turn. So if then afterwards you play Kabal Ghul, Kabal Ghul comes into play with an extra plus one plus one counter because a creature died that turn, right? So it, it just, it's such a weird card, which makes it really, really cool. I wish I had a copy myself. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really good with the Nevenerals disc as well, because you can, you know, blow up the whole board, kill a ton of creatures, and then after that player Cabo Ghoul, and you will just have a huge Cabo Ghoul because so many creatures died that turn. It's just weird. Anyway, I'm sure there are tons and tons of other great tricks in here and very interesting cards to talk about. Like, for example, Gauntlet of Chaos and an Elder Dragon in this deck. I have to say, Yoon, what a cool deck you've built. But I just suggest we're just going to discover that while we are looking at the match because I now want to continue with the deck of the opponent that's sitting um, in the right bottom corner, and that is Ryan. Let's take a look at his brew. And here we see the deck of Ryan, and it's quite interesting because Ryan is playing with the same colors as Yoon as some common. He's playing with black, red, and green as well, but then his commander is Xida Adian. Xida Adian, pretty good ride because it's three mana to cast only. It's a one, two flyer, and then you can p uh, pay uh, a black, a red, and a green and tap it, and target player draws a card. So that player, of course, 99.99% .99 of the time being yourself. So it's kind of a cheap jam day tome, right? You can start drawing cards. Of course, um, uh, Ryan is also playing with Aiden Oaken Shield because Aiden Oaken Shield is just a very powerful card. Uh, I'm also seeing a pretty heavy artifact theme in his deck. I'm seeing a Triskelion, which I think is very, very powerful because Trike comes in as a 4-4, right? With three plus one plus one counters, you can put those counters off to deal one damage to any target. And when you're playing multiplayer, there are simply more good targets. He can use his Triskelion to kind of kill uh, kill some commanders even, you know? So it's, it's really good. It's just something that I notice. Um, looking at the whole deck, I think it really shows the power of this color combination because... You know, you've got black, that means it's it's going to be kind of easy to kill some creatures, like an Ashes to Ashes is quite strong in this format. Demonic Tutor, of course, is amazing in this format. Uh, you also have Animate Debt, which is quite good. You can get a creature back, and not just your own, the biggest creature of your opponent. That's already amazing. So black is just a pretty good color. Green will help you to ramp up to make sure you get the right cards with, for example, Sylvan Library. Make sure you get the right mana with a cards like Untamed Wilds, although I don't see an Untamed Wilds in this deck. I personally think Untamed Wilds is really good, especially combining it with Sylvan, but it's not in this deck. I think Hurricane is not a really good one, but talking about color fixing, we have, of course, Birds of Paradise, which is an absolute all-star when it comes to color fixing, and that card is in this deck. Uh, I er earlier mentioned Hurricane, which I think is good. Desert Twister is usually too expensive, but this format takes long, remember that. So it also means that cards like Desert Twister get better. And remember, um, he's also playing with red, and that means he is playing with fork. I'm really happy to see fork in this brew because fork is just so good, especially here, because you've got multiple opponents. So you've got multiple people that will probably cast really good cards. Imagine uh, one of your opponents playing a huge fireball, killing one of your other opponents, and you're able to fork that fireball and kill another opponent. That means two uh, players out with one fireball. Fork can do that, right? Fork is also really good with the Desert Twister because Desert Twister can kill any permanent destroy, I should say. Copy that with Fork and you can choose two targets. Fork is going to be great. Personally, I'm always kind of nervous when I'm playing against a player who's got red in these long games. Because when you end up with just the two of you on board and you've probably got tons of mana out, both of us, it means that if my opponent with red just draws Disintegrate, draws Fireball, I'm done for. I'm dead, you know? So I could just be killed on the spot. So it's, it's always risky to play against a deck that also has red in there because you know there's burn. Now, before we move on to the last deck, there's just one card I want to kind of highlight here. That's Time Vault. I'm really surprised and interested to see Time Vault in this list. Time Vault is, of course, a card that comes into play tapped. And if you untap it, you can only untap it by um, uh, by giving up your turn. So you're basically saying, I'm going to skip my turn. I'm going to just pass it on. When you're playing multiplayer, it takes a long time before it's your turn again. So it could be huge to just skip a turn. On the other hand, maybe there are some stillmates on the board and it's going to be easy to skip a turn because the games are going to take long anyway and you've got 
a lot of life. We're starting with 40 life, right? So it's it's kind of double. Um, it's the first time I'm seeing this uh, being played at EDH. So I'm going to keep an eye on Time Vault. Hopefully, um, Ryan, you're going to draw into Time Vault and we can see it in action. Okay, so this is the deck of Ryan. Now let's take a look at the last deck on the table and that's the deck of Free Range Chicken, aka Daniel. Let's go. And here we see the deck of Daniel. Man, and this looks kind of impressive, Daniel. Wow. A lot of really like expensive cards, a lot of cards that you don't see often, and a lot of cool cards. So it's really a nice combination. I'm really looking forward to playing against this deck, but I'm also a little bit scared because you've got a lot of good cards in here. And the first good card I want to talk about is the commander, Angus McKenzie. Angus McKenzie, one green, one blue, one white to cast, a 2-2 creature that looks a lot like Tim the Enchanter. I made a video about it, but I have to agree with some of the comments I got is that the ability is really not aligned with Tim the Enchanter. When you look at the ability, the Timmy, the Protocol Sorcerer, is way more aligned with Tim the Enchanter. But okay, that's a different story and a different video. Let's focus on that ability. So we can pay a green, a blue, and a white. We can tap it. And then what it does is creatures attack and block as normal, but none deal any damage during combat. And all attacking creatures are still tapped. Use this ability only any time before attack damage is dealt. So... This is really good because what it means is Daniel can do an alpha strike and he doesn't have to worry on a kickback because then he can use his commander to not take any damage. It's kind of like a fog effect, right? Also, when he attacks and his opponent does something like unexpected, like cast an instant or, you know, giant grow, for example, he can respond by tapping Angus McKenzie and say, you know what? Nobody's taking any damage. So it's it's really, he can just attack for free, you know? He, he, it's just a great card. And... Also, what he can do is to choose, he can choose to use it defensively. He can just keep it untapped and, for example, have his Aladdin's ring on the table and deal four damage every turn and nobody can touch him because when you attack him, he's just simply going to use his Angus McKenzie. So that's just very, very good. Now, um, we also see some really scary good cards in this deck. I mean, look at that. Look at the blue power. We see Time Walk, Ancestral Recall. We see Time Twister. So those are just... Very powerful cards. I am looking forward, by the way, to your Time Twister, Daniel. I hope you're going to cast it because it's just so much fun. All of us are going to shuffle those 99-card decks together. <laughs> this is going to be mayhem. We also see some nice uh, board sweepers, by the way. Wrath of God, for example. Man, that's uh, that's going to have a, a big impact. I'm not kind of trying to scan your deck. And I do see a Neveneral's Disc. I think we're all playing with Neveneral's Discs. So it could be just a Neveneral's Disc Bonanza this matchup, that's just going to be going to be crazy. I also see Torment's Crypt, which I think is a really good card. I should actually play that in my list as well. Why is it good? Because there are just so many um, cards that allow you to do something with your graveyard, and Torment's Crypt removes the graveyard of an opponent. So, for example, we have somebody playing with Edun Oaken Shield. Remove your graveyard, and the Edun Oaken Shield is pretty useless. Um, there's one card I want to highlight, not because it's particularly good, but because I think it's such a cool card, it's a card from um, from Legends, and I just have to look it up here, and it's called uh, the Petra Sphinx. It's three white and two to cast. It's a three four, it does not fly. It should fly, but it does not fly. Um, but the ability is really cool. You can tap it and then target player names a card and then turns over the top card of his or her library. If it matches the named card, the card is put in the player's hand. Otherwise, it's put in the graveyard. Now, this, this is quite interesting, right? Because if you then know what card you're going to draw, you can actually use it. So you can use it in combination with your Sylvan Library. Um, you can also use it simply as a way to kind of soft mill your opponent. It's another way to do that. So it's pretty cool. And maybe, you know, there might be some reason that you want a specific card in your graveyard. You can use it for that as well. Now, before we start with the actual match, there's one little comment I want to make. And it's actually, Daniel, about your tablecloth. I think it looks <laughs> fantastic. But it reminds me of Urza's Mitre. And I think if you make a deck photo with this tablecloth, you should play with Urza's Mitre next time. So let me know if you've got that card in your collection. I think it's actually playable in um, in multiplayer. Why Everything's playable in multiplayer. Anyway, I think you should play it. Let me know in the comments below if you agree uh, with me here. Because, I mean, look at the Mitre, the pattern, and look at the tablecloth. This cannot be a coincidence, Daniel. This is higher power telling you to play that card. Anyway, we've looked at Daniel's deck, we've looked at my deck, we looked at Yoon's deck, we looked at Ryan's deck, 
And that means we are ready to dive into this EDH match. Let the game begin! And here we go. I believe it's Ryan in the right bottom corner who's on the player, starting with a mountain and casting a soul ring. What a start here for Ryan. And there we see, I believe that's a sand silo cast by Daniel. And that's one of those storage lands from Fallen Empire. So as long as it stays tapped, it gets a storage counter. It looks like I've got a turn one play here, casting a swamp, tapping it. Helm of Chatsuk. Talked about it in the deck deck. So I can use my helm to give uh, my uncle Istvan banding, and that's actually really, really good. Passing turn here to Ewan, who's playing with Edun Oakenshield. He's casting a City of Brass and passing turn. Let's see what Ryan's going to do. Or casting a Swamp. So he's got four mana. Is he going to cast something or just pass turn here? It looks like he is going to cast something. There's a Jam Daytone. What a start here for Ryan. Insane start for him. We see Daniel who's just playing a basic force pass turn here. And you can see that there's a, a storage counter now on the sand silos. So that, that land is like slowly ticking up. There's a swamp being played in a pass turn. So I don't have a follow-up play after that Helm of Chatsuk. There we see Ewan just casting a basic mountain passing turn here. Ryan playing a City of Brass. So he could cast his commander right now. I wonder if he's going to do that. Perhaps it's better to keep mana open to just draw an extra card. It looks like he is casting something. Tapping the City of Brass here. A Swamp and two. And there we see a Carrion Ant. So that's a zero one creature. And actually for one mana you can give it plus one plus one. So it's pretty good with all the mana that Ryan has right now. And Daniel's still not doing anything. Just casting a basic land and passing turn. Let's see if I've got a turn three play here. Playing a Swamp tapping. What are we going to get? Royal Assassin. That is a pretty good card. It's going to protect me from the Carrion Ants. And I wonder, maybe I can make a little deal with Ryan here. Five cards in hand for me and passing turn to Ewan. Ewan has just played a basic forest. He could play Edun Oakenshield. But maybe he's got better options. Edun Oakenshield at this point in the game, not very valuable yet because he doesn't have any creatures in the graveyard. Still casting it, so I guess he doesn't have an alternative. And passing turn here to Ryan. So Ryan's definitely in the driver's seat for now. I wonder if he's going to attack and who he's going to attack. I mean, Daniel's all open. He could attack Ewan, kind of forcing him to block. Maybe he just wants to go on me aggressive because I've got the Royal. Wouldn't make much sense, but still. He's drawing a card, actually, with the Gem Day Tome, so I guess he's not going to attack. Interesting choice. Passing turn here. There we see Daniel actually untapping the Sand Silos with two counters on them, so he's probably going to cast something. He's still missing white mana to cast his commander. And he's also playing a book here, Jam Day Tome, for Daniel. Wow, so two tomes on the board already. I'm, I'm feeling left out here. I mean, I've got a tome in my deck. Playing a swamp here. I've got the four mana for it. Tapping four. There's an Icy Manipulator. Wow! Icy with Royal Assassin. That is just insane. I'm actually taking a pretty big risk here. Maybe I should have waited one more turn to play Icy because then I would have a mana open to at least use it once. I am expecting the table now to respond to this to get rid of or the Royal or the Icy Manipulator here, one or the other. They're probably not going to allow me to have, have both. I guess if you're Ryan, you really want to get rid of one of the two. Oh, nice! Um, this is a is it Siphon Soul, I believe. What it does, it deals two damage to each opponent, and you gain life equal to the amount of damage it's dealt. So here we can see Ewan uh, going up in life here. So he's gaining six, and everybody else at the table is losing two. So this is great news for, uh, for Ewan. Pretty amazing. And Siphon Soul is actually one of like the first cards where I thought, hey, wait a minute, this is really good when you play with more people. I liked it, you know, back in the, back in the olden days. Anyway, it's Ryan's turn. Let's see what he's going to do. Is he going to get rid of one of my combo pieces here? No, he's not. He's playing a Basalt Monolith. And what else can he do? And just passing turn here. Wow. Daniel taking a card for turn. Playing out a swamp, uh, sorry, a forest here, not a swamp, and passing turn as well. I'm just flabbergasted. This means that my Royal Edmund on my Icy stay on the board here. 
I'm probably, okay, paying four again. What am I gonna cast here for four? Oh, I'm gonna cast my Uncle Istvan. Okay, that took me a moment to realize. I'm casting Uncle Istvan. Great blocker as well, also for the carrion ants. I have the Royal, of course. So one mana open to use the Icy. So probably on the end step of Daniel, I'm gonna use that. Now we see Ewan, who's, uh, ooh, interesting. He's playing that card um, that he can sacrifice creatures with. That is a really good one. All he needs now is a Rook Egg or another creature that he wants to sacrifice. So I'm pointing out my combo here with Helm of Chetsuk and Uncle Istvan. Let's see what Ryan can do. It looks like Ryan picked up a card with a Jam Day Tome. I mean, he's got so much mana, right? He's got card advantage, eight cards in hand. He should be able to do something. I'm pretty sure I'm going to kill a creature at the end step of Daniel here, so it's probably going to be the, the carry Nance. And he's tapping City of Brass, tapping a Swamp here. Tapping two more. What is he going to do? Oh, he's playing an Ashes to Ashes. Oh, that's bad news. So in response, I'm going to kill the carry Nance. And he's actually targeting both my creatures. So Uncle Istvan's going back to the command zone. Oh, this is brutal. And I'm losing my Royal Assassin. So kind of in revenge, I am destroying his carrion ants. Oh, man. And there we see a Ring of Immortals. So Ring of Immortals, quite interesting artifact from Legends. And uh, I think you can... Ah, oh, what does it do again? I'll have it up on the screen so you can have a look at what it does. And it looks like, yeah, Daniel's passing turn after playing at Ring of Immortals. So I've got five in hand here. Tapping all five. Am I going to cast? Oh, I want to say send your vampire, but I'm actually casting a fallen angel. Very cool. So this is a 3-3 three, three flyer, and I can sacrifice a creature to give it a plus 2, plus 1. And there we see some coming and tapping. Oh, he's actually... No, he can't because it's removed from the game. He can't do that. Exactly, we're being corrected. I mean, he can take the carrying ants if he wants to. I don't think he wants to, though. So he's saying, no, nah, that's fine. I'll just keep my anime dead in hand here. Oh, there we see a Rook Egg. Oh, ho, ho. so he can use the Rook Egg. Oh, man, this is so good. So what he can do now is he can actually use his Life Chisel in his upkeep. Sack the Rook Egg to the Life Chisel. That's that artifact. Get a 4-4 Bird Token. And then in the same turn, get the Rook Egg back with a Lunokan Shield recast it. Anyway, we're already at Ryan's turn here. And he is playing a two-headed giant. Such a cool creature. 4-4 Trampler. And it can block two creatures because it get two heads. Wow, a lot of stuff happening right now in the game. Look at Daniel there playing a Felwer Stone. Is he doing something else there? We tell him to... He's telling me to hold it up. Taking a damage from his own City of Brass. Oh, there we see Ragnar. <laughs> such a cool creature. Not a great creature, but just such... I love the art of Ragnar. I mean, just a Viking, isn't it? So what he does is he can regenerate other creatures. So it's actually, he's actually pretty strong. Anyway, taking on my turn here, six in hand. I still got my Icy, I'm happy with that. Sorry, six mana. Oh, Taggle Maggot. What am I gonna play the Taggle Maggot on? I wonder, I'm first explaining what it does. So Taggle Maggot is an enchant creature and uh, you put it on target creature and then that creature gets a minus, old, uh, minus one counter every turn so it slowly gets eaten away by the taggle maggot and attacking here with the fallen angel who am i attacking it looks like i'm attacking ewan because he was on the highest life total so he's going to drop to 41 there we see ewan sacking the rook act to the life chisel here so he's going to gain life again he's going to go back up to 44 exactly and he's not going to get the bird token yet he's got to wait till the end of the turn but what i wanted to say about taggle maggot is the great thing about taggle maggot is once um, the creature that it enchants dies, the controller of that creature can move it on to another creature. So it doesn't go out of the game. It's pretty cool. And here we see kind of uh, Ewan doing that trick where he uses his Aedun Oaken Shield to get the Rook Egg back into his hand. And he also gets the 4-4 Flying Bird token. 
So he's got his own little bird machine, his egg machine. There we see Ryan attacking here onto Ragnar with his 4-4 Trampler. Onto Daniel, it seems, who's blocked it here with, uh, with Ragnar. Or is he just taking the damage? Yeah, he's blocking it. Okay, and then taking the Trample damage, of course. So that's interesting that he's blocking. Maybe he's got like a balance or something? Why would he want to block here and kill his own creature? Instead of just taking the damage. Very interesting. What else is Ryan going to do here? Also playing Ring of Immortals. Wow. So Ring of Immortals, I took a moment to look it up. It's three and tap. It counters target interrupt or enchantment. Can only counter spells which target a permanent under your control. So for example, if I would use the Taggle Maggot against him, then, um, then it would slowly... Um, then he could counter it. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. And I'm now thinking while I'm saying this, I'm thinking he's blocking with the Rachnar because I enchanted it with Taggle Maggot. So now uh, the creature is dead and Daniel can pick a new target for the Taggle Maggot. Man, this game is pretty tough to follow. <laughs> anyway, I'm taking turn here. Going to tap four. What am I going to do with four? So many options. Playing a Drain Life of two on Adun Oakenshield. So I kind of want to stop his egg laying machine. That doesn't mean I'm going up to lives. And am I also going to attack you in here? It looks like I've attacked Daniel. He's dropping to 32. And passing turn. I wonder where the Taggle Maggot is right now. I believe it was put on a two headed giant. And there we see a very interesting enchantment played by Yuan. Um, what's it called again? Every time. It's from the Antiquities, and every time somebody taps an artifact for mana or to use its ability, you actually gains a life. So that's going to be insane. So when Ryan draws a card, for example, then you gains a life. It's ridiculous. There's the attack with the two-headed giant. Who is he attacking at the moment? And it looks like I'm doing something with the Icy Manipulator. I'm tapping down the Rook Egg, so you cannot block it with the Rook Egg. And is Ewan going to take the damage here? So he's taken the 4 damage. We also see a counter being placed on the 2-headed giant. That's a minus 0, minus 1 counter from the Taggle Maggot. So it's now an 0-3. Uh, sorry, a 4-3, uh, of course. And what else can Ryan do here? He's actually discarding a card, discarding the beautiful Sheevan Dragon. Remember, he does have an Adun Oaken Shield in his deck, so maybe he's thinking, you know, I'm just going to fill up my graveyard already for when I draw into that Adun Oaken Shield later in the game. And, oh, there he goes. So Daniel also casting his uh, commander here, Angus McKenzie. So remember, that's kind of like a fog machine, right? For a white, a green, and a blue, he can uh, make sure that no nothing deals damage during combat. That's what I'm trying to say. He does have to tap Angus McKenzie to do so. And I'm playing a soul net here. That means I'm going to gain a life every time a creature is going to go to the graveyard. And remember, tokens now also go to the graveyard first. So I'm also getting a life when a token gets, uh, gets killed. Not relevant right now, but it might be later in the game. And attacking again with my Falling Angel. My Falling Angel is doing some work. Looks like I'm attacking Daniel again here. It's going to drop to 28. And there is the big book. The Jam Day Tome on my side. And that is definitely wanted because I've only got two cards in hand. And he's now going to sack it to the Life Chisel. So he's going to gain that bird token at the end. We really need to take care of that Life Chisel. Is he going to recast? He's going to play an Animate Dead. Oh, he's going to steal that Sheevan Dragon, of course. Of course, Ewan still had that animate. I forgot about that. I guess Ryan did too. What? It's attacking with a 4 4 flying bird. Looks like he's attacked Ryan here. He's going to drop to 29. Oh, this is bad news. And I mean, you know, Ewan is gaining life. You're wondering why is his life ticking up? It's from the life chisel, but also. From that green card there, that enchantment is going to give him a life every time somebody uses their artifact. So Ryan is now giving you and two life, I believe, by tapping the Soaring and the Basalt Monolith. That's just insane. I believe it's called Power Leech. The name, anyway, Ewan is going up again. Um, the two-headed giant should get another counter from the Taggle Maggot, by the way. It should now be a 4-2. 
I wonder if he's going to do that. So Ryan on 28, Daniel all of a sudden dropped all the way to 24. I'm still on 40, and Ewan is on 47. That's really good. There's a hurricane. Ho oh, ho! A huge hurricane. That is actually very effective. He's going to take out two birds, an animated zombie dragon, and he's going to kill my fallen angel. That is a really good hurricane. I mean, so powerful in multiplayer. And look at Daniel's life total. He's on 16. Who would have thought that the player playing with Angus McKenzie would be the lowest at the table at this point in the game? 16. I'm on double life on 32. There we do see a Black Lotus from Daniel. I still have one mana up to use my Icy Manipulator at the end step of Daniel. I wonder if I'm going to use it. I guess I could tap the Giant. I'm not doing it though. Just passing turn here. And tapping six, recasting Uncle Istvan for six mana. It probably is better to just keep the mana open for my Gem Tone, but okay, I guess I just really want to cast my commander here because it is Uncle Istvan's day out, right? That's the title of my deck, so I want to give him his day out. I mean, he's been living like a hermit forever. He needs to look around, enjoy the scenery, and the scenery is, uh, is pretty interesting. And we see Ewan here recasting Aiden Oakenshield. Makes absolute sense. Six cards in hand for him and passing turn. Also six cards in hand for Ryan. And look at that. So he's realizing he's missed that counter. So that means the two-headed giant is now a 4-1. This is the last turn that the two-headed giant is still alive. So if he's going to attack me, I'm probably just going to block it with my uncle. If he's going to attack Daniel, he's probably going to use his Angus McKenzie. So the best target seems to be Ewan here. He's also on the highest life. So I wonder if he's going to attack Ewan. We'll just have to wait and see. Attacking here, of course, with the 4-1. And yeah, he's attacking Ewan. That makes sense, of course. So Ewan is going to drop to 36. Actually gaining a life again because an artifact was used, I guess. Oh, man, it's just hilarious. Every time an artifact gets tapped, look at that life total of Ewan go. Oh, it's such a good card in multiplayer. Let's see what Daniel's going to do, though. Okay, so he's played the Sylvan Library, which is, of course, a good card. But, I mean, he needs some life here. Six in hand passing turn. Just playing a Swamp here. Okay, I'm going to finally use my book. That's about time. I'm going to go up to three. And it looks like I'm just passing turn. So I guess Ewan can now use his Aedun Oakenshield to get back the Rook Egg. Is that what he's going to do here? No. Oh, he's going to play... What's the name again? Torvalki. It's, um, it's a 2-2 two -two creature, is it? Oh, man. And it can deal two damage to an attacking or blocking creature? It is actually not a 2-2, but a 3-3, I believe. Anyways, it's Ryan's turn here. Untapping his stuff. And now we see the two-headed giant dying to the Taggle Maggot. So now Ryan has to pick a different target. Question is, who is he going to pick? I mean, he might as well put it on me. I think he cannot pick Daniel because he's got the mana open for the Ring of Immortals. I think Daniel can use the Ring of Immortals to protect his Angus. He could, of course, put it on the Torwauki as well. That might be an interesting target. Because, although, yeah, or the Aedun Ad Oaken Shield. So this is kind of annoying, right? We don't know who's the target until we see that first counter being placed. So we'll just have to be patient here. And I believe it's still Ryan's turn, or did he pass? Or No, it's still his turn. So he's going to tap the Soaring again alive for you in here. I mean, oh, that Power Leech is so good. So good. No, he's actually taking it back. He's going to take a damage from the City of Brass, not using his Soul Ring. So Ewan's going to stay on 40. There we see Aedun Oakenshield, which is really, really good because there's a Carrion Ants, a Sheevan Dragon, and a Two-Headed Giant there in the Graveyard of Ryan. And Ryan has passed turn here to Daniel, who's going to look at the top three of his deck because he's got that Sylvan. And look at the life total of Daniel, 16. It's quite low. He really needs to find a way to... Uh... Oh, he's played an Ancestral Recall. Okay, that's kind of a way to make, a, to make a comeback or to try to find some life here. There's a Cockatrice. 
At least that's a good blocker. I mean, he's got, it's really hard to deal damage, actually, with creature, with combat damage to Daniel, because he's got the Angus McKenzie, and now he also has the Cockatrice. So that's some insurance for him, but he is on a pretty low uh, life total. Also, he's got quite a lot of counters on that sand silo, by the way. I wonder what he wants to do with that. He's actually discarding a Birds of Paradise instead of playing it out. I guess he wants to keep that uh, City of Brass open for some kind of trick or something. He also has a Diamond Valley, of course. There we see me casting a Siphon Soul, so I'm going to gain some life here. Going to go up to 38 and passing turn. So now I'm pointing to the Taggle Maggot. So are we going to see a counter here on one of the creatures of Ewan? So I guess one of Ewan's creatures got enchanted with the Taggle Maggot. I guess it's a Torvalki because he's going to sack the Torvalki to the Life Chisel. And now he can pick a new target. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's so cool. I, this is what I like about the Taggle Maggot. You get so much value in multiplayer because it just stays around and they've never targeted me, not a single time so far. And I wonder who they're going to target now. We're just going to have to wait and see where the, where the counter goes. Anyway, it's still you and Stern. He's sacked the Torvalki to the Life Chisel, which is still around, which is insane. Look at that Boris Devil Boon. So this is actually a token maker. Wow, I mean, Ewan's deck, it's, it's really working on all cylinders. And, I mean, look at his life total, 47. I mean, look at, look at Ryan, look at Daniel, they're very, very low. And I'm still on 39 too, I mean, I've played the Siphon Soul, you know, I've got the, uh, the Soul Net to gain some life from time to time. I had that Drain Life, things are looking up for me. There we see a tap with Basil Monolith and with Soul Ring. So even more life for you and Wow, Mirror Universe! That's insane! Wow, this is great news for Ryan. What he can do next turn with Mirror Universe, you can um, change life totals, but you can only do it during your upkeep. So what Ryan can do is next turn, which is very far away in EDH, but next turn... Um, he can sack his mirror to switch life totals. He can get the life of Ewan if he wants to. He'll, he'll go to 49 and Ewan will go down to 17. That is insane. Let's first kind of see what Daniel's going to do here. Looks like he's quite busy. Is he going to use his Jam Day Tome on end step? No, he's already taking his turn. Oh, there we see Rasputin Dreamweaver hitting the board. That's such a nice card to see in action. Very rare card. You don't see it often. And a pass turny from Daniel. So it's actually quite interesting because Daniel's got a lot of very strong and powerful cards, but he hasn't been really involved in the game thus far. Looks like I'm not using my uh, IC manipulator here on the end step of Daniel. Counting my mana. Tapping a whole bunch of them. There's a diabolic machine. So the machine is a 4-4 creature. Then you can pay two to regenerate it, that's it. And it's seven to cast. I know it's it's pretty steep, but hey, man, in these games, you've got forever anyway. And regeneration is actually pretty valuable. I mean, there are so many discs around, you know, and it's just good to have, like, four power that you can attack with without being worried that it'll die in combat. Talking about combat, we're not seeing much. I guess it's because uh, Angus McKenzie as well... And Ewan now taking a turn, of course, he's thinking about what can I do against the Mirror Universe? Because next turn, Ryan can use his mirror and steal the 51 life from Ewan. That's going to be so painful. I mean, this game, uh, it's just taking forever. I mean, Daniel's the lowest, but he's got the Pillow Fort deck, so it's going to be really tough to deal damage to him. And, and Ewan is now going to trade lives with Ryan, which is great for Ryan and bad for Ewan. On the other hand, Ewan will get, you know, back up in life because of that power leech. So this, I mean, we're in for a long game here. Tapping, it looks like four mountain snow. Okay, just tapping three, taking back the Rook Egg. That makes sense. He's got enough mana to play it out. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. So he's going to drop to 50. He's going to play it out. Probably going to pass turn here. And then, um, yeah, Ryan is going to take the life. So end step, he's going to use his Oaken Shield. So two Oaken Shields on the board at the moment. And the Oaken Shield is being targeted by the Taggle Maggot, it seems. So it's now going to die to the Taggle Maggot. The Taggle Maggot is doing so much work. And now Ryan can pick a new target for the Taggle Maggot. But more importantly, Ryan can switch lives. 
He's probably going to do that, right? I, I cannot imagine that he's not going to do that. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank. Maybe he wants to switch with me and then kill me off or something. Or maybe he doesn't want to switch yet, but that would be a pretty big risk. I mean, the mirror's on the board. He can just gain tons of life. Personally, I would just use it now. You never know what's going to happen if you're waiting a whole turn in EDH. That's practically forever. I mean, do it while you still can. Usually, you know, when you play against an opponent, you have one opponent to worry about. You know, maybe one opponent will find an answer to your mirror. But in this case, you've got three opponents that are maybe going to try to find an answer to the mirror. And yes, he's going to use it. So he's going to activate the mirror and he's going to trade lives here. Oh, ho, ho! Ewan. And of course, he's first going to gain a life because of artifact activation. So he's going to steal 52 life. That's just insane. And he's going to drop to 17 here. So Ryan's going to go back up to 52. Oh, man. And he's also got the Sheevan Dragon in hand. He's now going to cast it out. There's a 5-5 Sheevan Dragon. That is huge. But actually, it's not that impactful on the board because I've got an Icy Manipulator. Daniel's got Angus McKenzie. Daniel's taking his turn out, by the way. So it's only really threatening here for Ewan because he doesn't have a Flyer yet. But he's probably going to... Sack his Rook Egg to the Life Chisel when it's his turn. So let's see what Daniel can do here. Going through his cards. So seven cards in hand. And I mean, maybe, maybe this is what Daniel wants to do. You know, kind of like wait and see what happens. Oh, he's going to do something. A huge fireball or something? Kind of maybe kill a lot of people off. Oh, a huge stream of life. Oh, <laughs> And I said Fireball, by the way, which is really stupid because guess what? Daniel's not playing red. So, sorry guys. I should have said huge hurricane or something. But wow, a huge stream of life here by Daniel. I love that, man. I love using your sand silos, kind of letting it slowly tick up to you play a huge stream of life. That's just very flavorful. And he's going to go all the way up to 32. And I'm using my uh, Icy Manipulator here to tap down the Sheevan Dragon. And I'm now taking my turn. Two in hand. Attacking with the Diabolic Machine. It looks like I'm... Am I going to attack Ryan? Probably, because he's gone up all the way to 52. So I probably want to deal some damage here. And of course, a life also for Ewan, because I'm attacking with an artifact. My artifact gets tapped. That card is so insane. Anyway, dealing 4 damage to Ryan. Sorry, Ryan, but I'm sure you understand. You're so high up. And I also think, you know, when you can attack with your Diabolic Machine, you have to attack with your Diabolic Machine. And, I mean, I can attack Daniel, but he's just going to use his Angus... And I can attack Ewan, but he's just going to block with the Rook Egg. Talking about Rook Egg, Ewan just sacked his Rook Egg to gain some more life. So he's already up to 24. Remember, he was on 17 just a moment ago when, uh, when Ryan traded life with him. So Ewan's deck is just really good at gaining life. That's something to take note of. And I mean, look at the life totals, by the way. We're all over the 20. This is really going to be a long game. There we see a pass turn by Ewan, and there's his uh, Rook token. So it's Bird token, I should say, 4-4 four, four Flyer. Let's see what Ryan's going to do. Is he going to attack somebody with that Sheevan Dragon? I wonder if he is. He's now in 48. Still has that Jam Day Tome that he's been having since turn 2. I mean, it's just ridiculous value. Talking about the Tomes, by the way, Daniel's got one, I've got one. Ewan is the only one without a Jam Day Tome. So we're just waiting here to see if Ryan is going to do something. Yeah, he's going to attack with a Sheevan. Pointing out that I have an icy manipulator before he does. <laughs> That's probably political. I'm, the thing is with icy, I have to use it before he actually attacks. So he's going to say, I'm going to go to my combat step. Does anybody want to respond? Oh, he's attacking me. So I was, pro yeah, I remember this part. I was telling Ryan, I said, you know what? I'm not going to use my icy because I believe you're going to do the right thing. And he said, yeah, I'm going to do the right thing. So I didn't use it, and then he attacked me. So <laughs> it's, I guess that was the right thing to do. So 
I dropped to 35 here. It's my own fault. So the problem again is with the IC. If I want to use it, I have to use it before I know who he's going to attack. And of course, I want Ryan to just, you know, attack, I don't know, Ewan or something. Somebody else, not me. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be tough for me. Let's see what Daniel's going to do, by the way. It looks like he's tapping a lot of mana again. Oh, Nevenerals disc. I'm actually not really unhappy by this disc. I mean, I wonder if I'm going to use my IC or am I going to use... Yeah, I'm going to use my IC. I'm going to tap something down. Tap down the Angus McKenzie. I'm also going to use my Jam Day Tome. Going to go up to three, four cards in hand. Am I going to actually attack Daniel here? I don't think it really matters that much. I mean, I can attack him with the Diabolic Machine, but then I'm also opening up myself. So using my IC, tapping down the Rasputin and attacking here. Looks like I'm attacking Ryan for one. I'm attacking Daniel for four. Yep, that's exactly what's happening. Okay, dealing some damage. That's kind of nice. I, I want to, you know, I want to attack with my creatures. I don't want to sit back and wait. I know it's not the best thing to do because now I'm all open, but I just hope that other players appreciate my... Um, my assertiveness in this game. Talking about that Ewan's turn now. So he's got a 4-4 flying bird token. He's going to use his Aedun Oaken Shield on my end step. He's going to get back the Rook Egg again. Oh, man. He's also going to make a token with Devil Boon. I guess if you're Ewan, you really don't want uh, Daniel to use that Nevenerals disc. There he's using Devil Boon again, getting another counter. Then he's going to sack it to... No, is he going to sack it to the Life Chisel to gain some life? Yeah, I guess he is. Well, why? he's probably thinking, you know, um, Daniel... Oh, because of the Taggle Maggot. I keep forgetting the Taggle Maggot. It's still around. What is he going to put the Taggle Maggot on? No idea what he put it on. We'll just have to keep a close look. I'm using my soul net, by the way, to gain a life for Boris Devil Boon. And I guess I want to keep a lot of mana. I've got enough mana anyway. But I think when that disc pops, I can gain a lot of life from my soul net. I'm on 36, so things are looking still pretty good for me. Who is you and going to attack with the bird token? Is he going to attack anybody? I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. I'm kind of expecting Daniel to use his Nevenerals disc next turn. So who is he attacking here? Oh, he's untapped a bird again. So I guess he's not attacking anybody. Looking at his hand kind of in the tank here. I mean, the disc is on the board. He might as well play a little bit more aggressive. On the other hand, maybe he thinks, you know, I want to keep my bird on tapping duty just in case Ryan goes charging in with that huge Sheevan Dragon. So that makes sense as well. And okay, he's going to play something out. Ooh, interesting. Granite Gargoyle. This really surprises me. I would have expected him, or oh, he doesn't have enough mana to do that, because I would have expected him to play the Rook Egg, perhaps. He's also going to discard a card there. And that's one of the Elder Dragons, the Vivictus Asmadi. There we see Ryan drawing a card there from his Gem Tome and then taking on his turn. So that means more life for, uh, for you in here. It's going to go up to 33. And okay, so I guess the Taggle Maggot is now... On the Sheevan Dragon. Oh, the Tegel Maggot has done so much work. It's just it's hilarious. So I'm all open, actually. So Ryan can now just, you know, attack me for a lot with the Sheevan. He can deal, if he wants to, he can deal 8 damage to me and I would drop to 27. So we'll just have to wait and see what he's going to do here. Also funny to note, by the way, is that Daniel and Ryan both have Ring of Immortals. 
I hardly ever see that card, and I'll mean a game where two players have it. It's just so funny. So there's an attack with the Sheevan Dragon. He's going to block on the Cockatrice. And then he's going to sack it to the Diamond Valley. Yeah, that means that both creatures are going to die. So I'm going to use my Soul Net twice. I'm going to go up to 37. And the Taggle Maggot is going to move house again. I mean, I don't think it matters much because I'm just expecting the angle to use the disc, but maybe he's not going to use it in his own uh, turn. Maybe he's going to wait for the right moment. There we see a scavenger folk. Looks like he's going to do something more. Also casting an Argovian Pixies. Interesting. Interesting to see Ryan actually casting. Well, he needs some blockers, I guess, but... You know what I mean, like it's um, with the disc on the table. And it looks like he's going to eat up his own Angus McKenzie to his Diamond Valley. And now he's going to move the Taggle Maggot again. So I guess the Taggle Maggot was on Angus. And now there's a Taggle Maggot on um, the Scavenger Folk, it seems. Wow, there's just, there's, there's, the Taggle Maggot has been around forever. And now Daniel has that untapped disc, but it looks like he's not going to use it yet. Why would he? He could just wait for an entire turn. And he could just do it at the end step of Rhino or in response of somebody trying to get rid of the Nevenerals disc. There we see a, this is an attack with the Rasputin Dreamweaver. And then he's using the Tormus script here. To get rid of Ryan's graveyard. Wow, I would have expected him to get rid of Ewan's graveyard, actually. And it looks like Daniel's really preparing. Yeah, he's going to use the disc, right? He's going to use the disc. Because he was doing so much all of a sudden. <laughs> and then you kind of know, okay, he's going to use the disc. So everything's going to get wiped. L look at my side of the table. I'm kind of refusing to take stuff away. But uh, it's all over, at least. Can I get some life from Soulnet? I don't think I can, because they're all going to go to the graveyard at the same time, right? Okay, I can regenerate Diabolic Machine, and I can draw a card. Okay, that's actually pretty good. And now everything is going to die. Okay, that's why I waited. I had to decide what to do. Taggle Maggot also gone. That's too bad. But hey, I've still got a creature. That's not, look at, I'm actually the only one with the creature still. Oh, and an Aladdin's ring on the side of Daniel. I missed that completely. Ooh, that's a good one. So Aladdin's ring for eight and tap, he can deal four damage to any target. And that may sound like a really bad card, but guess what? In this scenario today, in this situation, it's a great card. Talking about a great card, here's a Frozen Shade, which is really good with all my swamps. Oh man, but that Aladdin's ring is so annoying. And let's see what Ewan's going to do here. And okay, it looks like he's played the Felwer Stone. Oh, he's playing um, a Regrowth. Oh no, not that card again. No. At least he, oh, he does have a green because of the Felwer Stone. No, not that Power Leech. Not again, Ewan. We just got rid of it. All it's going to do is prolong your life for forever. And it's going to, I mean, this game, this, this game is never going to end. This game is never going to end. I mean, look at our life totals, by the way. 44 for Ewan. 47 for Ryan. It's just taken his turn. 34 for Daniel. 34 for me. This is ridiculous. Okay, so he's going to cast something. Tranquility. Ryan, you the man, Ryan. I love it. I love it. The Tranquility is so, so worth it. And he's also going to play Xira, his commander. But now, of course, here we have Daniel, the trouble on the table with his Aladdin's ring. That ring is so powerful. I mean, he's probably just going to keep it up and use it on defense. I mean, it does take eight mana. So he also has an untapped sand silo. So I wonder, he's got a hand. Look at his hand. It's full. At least seven. Yeah, seven cards. The blue dice there, by the way, they represent the amount of cards he's got in hand. There, we see a Desert Twister on what? 
and a frozen shade. Wow. I mean, yeah, I guess I guess frozen shade is very scary. I guess it makes sense because I can attack Daniel with a huge frozen shade. So, yeah. And it, or I could have attacked you one. So I guess yeah, because look at the amount of swamps I have. I just I didn't realize how good a frozen shade can be. I'm a little bit in the tank here, attacking with my diabolic machine. Am I gonna attack Daniel for destroy? I think I'm attacking Daniel. There's the swords. On my Diabolic, so I'm going to go up to 38. Yeah, of course I had to attack Daniel after he killed my Frozen Shade. Of course, playing an Uncle Istvan. And playing a Zombie Master. So Zombie Master isn't going to do much because I don't have any other zombies on board. But if I get to cast a couple of zombies, remember they get Swamp Walk. Um, and they also get Regeneration for one black. Obviously the problem here at the table is still the Aladdin's Ring, because right now Daniel can just kill all the creatures. He just needs enough mana. There we also see Exida on the side of Ewan, who's playing with the same colors as Ryan, but they have a different commander. And of course there's that Rook Egg that he still had from a while back in his hand. Man, he's cast that Rook Egg a lot this turn. Let's see what Ryan can do. So Ryan's on 47. He can start drawing some cards with Exida, I guess. Ooh, good card. Triskelion on the table. Could choose to trike here to take out some creatures, but he's probably just gonna wait. Trike is always a good card to negotiate with. There's actually an attack with Xira, that's so funny. Is he gonna attack Daniel here? Gonna drop him to 32. No, he's gonna attack me. Okay, that's ah, that's just funny. Yeah, why not? You know, he can he can deal damage. Why not? It's better than doing nothing. I'm still a little bit surprised that Daniel's not just tapping his sand silo so it can start ticking up again. Or does he want to keep two blue open for counter magic? That could be the case as well, of course. Ooh, there we see that, um, that circle of protection from Legends that can protect you for two colors. What was the name again? A great Realm of Preservation, that's it. And I believe you can pay one white and one to prevent uh, damage from a black swords or red swords. Anyway, it looks like I've taken my turn. And, or have I? I think I have. Only two cards in hand. Oh, maybe, yeah. Okay, and I'm going to attack somebody with my, uh, my zombie master. And I'm attacking Daniel here. So he's going to drop to 30 and I'm just passing turn. So I'm not doing a lot. And of course, the problem here for Daniel is, I mean, Greater Realm is a great card. But he only has one white source. And that's the City of Brass. So... It's not ideal. He needs more white mana. He's been really low on white mana, by the way, the entire game. Let's see what uh, Ewan's going to do. I mean, it looks like he just drew a card there with Xira. Going to take a damage from the Felwar, or sorry, from the City of Brass. Ashes to Ashes! Ho oh ho! Who is he going to target here? I wonder. I mean... To be honest, I don't think there's really a need to play an Ashes to Ashes right now. I mean, yeah, he's going to take out my Zombie Master. Okay. He's going to take out the Triskelion. So Trike's going to ping you in for three. He could have killed. Oh, he's actually changing his mind. He's taking it back. He's like, well, this is not really a good Ashes to Ashes. I agree you and I think it's not worth all the trouble. Let's see what he's going to do here. I mean, there's a maze. So that's, I mean, that's going to protect him. Tapping something here. Okay, playing a Nevenerals disc. Again, a disc. And of course, I mean, I think we're all playing with one copy of disc. So it, it, it's, it makes sense that we're seeing the discs now that we're kind of midway this, uh, this match. So we saw Daniel using a disc earlier. Now Ewan has played his disc. Remember, I still have a disc and Ryan still has a disc. And I think it's actually good for the game that you have a lot of board resets because these board states can kind of, you know, get complicated really quickly and kind of also gum up the board that kind of nothing's happening anymore. And a disc kind of always creates this new energy. There we see a Jalum tone, by the way, on the side of Ryan. 
So with Jalen Tome, you can pay two and tap and draw a card, but then you have to discard a card as well. So we see an attack here by Triskelion. And who is he going to attack? He's attacked Daniel. So Daniel dropped here to 26. And now it's a pass turn to Daniel. And there's a regrowth. Maybe on Ancestral Recall. Yeah, Ancestral Recall. Like, it makes sense. I wonder what Daniel can do. I guess play a planes at least. You know, to be able to use a greater realm of preservation multiple times. There we see a Simbat. So it can help him to kind of dig for lands and at least it's a good chum blocker if need be. Ooh, a Book of Wrath. So with Book of Wrath, I can pay two. It's a card from the dark. I take two damage and I can draw a card. And I'm on 37, so that's not too bad. I guess, I wonder why I do this with a Neverknows Disc on play, but maybe I'm just doing it to, to kind of force Ewan's hand. Maybe that's it. I wonder, maybe there's something in my hand that makes me want to want Ewan to use the disc so I can do that afterwards. Also attacking with the Zombie Master here and passing turn. So, you know, doing some business. And now it's all up to Ewan. Is he going to use his disc? Counting his mana. Remember, when he uses the disc, I mean, he kills his own Rook Egg. Oh, look at that. I guess he doesn't want to use the disc because he just played a Serpent Generator. So that's a way to make 1-1 one -one snakes. And he's just passing turn. Wow. I, I must say I'm a little bit surprised. I was expecting him to, to pop the disc, but when Isam played a Serpent Generator, I, re I realized he was not going to. I mean, I guess... He doesn't find it necessary. There we see Ryan drawing some cards because he used that Xira on the end step of Ewan. And uh, Ryan on 45 right now. Daniel 26. I'm on 35. Ewan on 44. There is an attack with the trike. Gonna attack Ewan, it seems. But Ewan might as well just, uh, oh, does he want to block with the Rook Egg? Is he going to use, maybe he's not going to use the Disc. Or he could just, he could just use the Maze, by the way. Oh, that's stupid. Maybe he's not seeing it. Looks like he's really in the tank here. He's just going to take the damage, going to drop to 40. He could have used the Maze. Interesting situation here. Yeah, now he re remembers the maze. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. He's going to use... It's fine. He's using the maze here. I mean, this is a relaxed table. You know, we're not going to... We're not diehards here. It's fine. There's so much stuff on your side, you, and it can happen. It's confusing. Anyway, the Triskelion gets sent back by the maze of if. And now it's up to Ryan. Is he going to use his little book, for example? He's still got enough mana open. Tapping four is going to cast a giant spider, two four, that can block creatures with flying because it's got a giant web. It's a giant spider. And there is a disenchant. Is it going to be on the Nevenerals disc? I think it's on the Nevenerals disc. Is he forcing Ewan's hand here? Yeah, he's forcing Ewan's hand. Brilliant. Well done, Daniel. I'm just happy. It's, it's good to have a disc on the board, but it's even better when the disc just goes off, blows up the whole board, and we can all start over again. I guess I'm really thinking now what to do. So three damage going to be thrown to you and first. And it looks like Ryan's going to draw a card there. I can at least draw some cards from my Book of Rass. Oh, look at that. I'm going to drop a lot of life. I couldn't follow that, but it looks like I'm drawing four more cards. I guess I dropped eight life here. I think it's a good decision. I mean, 27 is still more than enough life. It's still fine. Although I'm almost the lowest at the table, only Daniel's got less life. It's going to go to 25. Oh, this is a cool creature. Um, a legend. Sir something something? It's like a big beef boy. It's a vanilla. 
It's white and it's green. Sir Chandelar, right? I think so. And oh, a nightmare! Wow, this is brilliant. That nightmare is huge. I'm also playing a throw retainer on it, giving it plus one, plus one. And more importantly, I can sacrifice a throw retainer to give it regeneration. And I'm also casting Uncle Istvan. I wonder how big my, um, my nightmare is. It looks like I'm counting. So it's a 10, 10. It's 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, 16. It's a 17, 17 plus a, the throw retainer. I think it's now an 18, 18. So that's huge. So I think I can start killing some people. Oh no, there's the ashes to ashes. Of course, Ewan still had that one. I'm so toast. Wait a minute, what's Daniel doing there? He's playing a counter spell, saving his own creature, but also my nightmare. This is great. So Ewan is not doing anything. I mean, Ewan, Ewan you have a maze of it. You're fine, man, no worries. Let me have my 18-18. And it looks like he's going to attack Ryan here or Daniel. And he is attacking Daniel here. Ooh, he's on 21. If I can swing in, Daniel's done for. Oh, but Daniel's still got four cards in hand. I wonder. So 18-18, it seems. Not sure why I'm taking away that note. That was kind of handy. But anyway, it's Ryan's turn. And he's casting a regrowth. What is he going to get back here? Ring of Immortals. Interesting. I mean, there's so much good in it in, in his graveyard. Maybe I'm underestimating Ring of Immortals. He's also played a Maze of If, by the way. Or maybe that was there already, but I'm, I'm noticing it right now. Oh, he's playing Scenic Poltergeist. That's such a funny card. It's from Antiquities. You can tap it, and then target artifact comes to life equal to its uh, to its casting cost. It still keeps its abilities, by the way. So that Soul Ring, for example, can be made into a 1-1 one, one artifact creature that you can tap for 2 mana. It's, uh, it's also a cool way to kill Moxon. There we see a recall being played here by Daniel. Putting away two cards here. What is he going to get back? Ooh, that looks like... Swords to Plowshares and probably again an Ancestral Recall. Yeah, again an Ancestral Recall. That's now the third time he's played a Recall or the fourth time? I'm not sure. That's at least a lot of value. And there's a pass turn. So, I mean, I've got a huge, a huge nightmare. I guess if I'm going to attack uh, Daniel here, he's going to play his Swords, but he's the only target that I have. I mean... Both Ewan and uh, Ryan have a maze of if. Oh, that's so cool! Oh, playing a Corvus Bell. Now all my swamps are 1-1 one, one creatures, so it doesn't matter that, you know, for example, Ryan's got one maze of if. Who cares? You know, I can just attack with my swamp army. It looks like I'm, I'm dividing them up. So I'm attacking 2, 4, 6, 7, no, 8, 2, yeah. Two, four, no, seven to each. So seven to you and seven to Ryan. Right? Let's just see what's happening. Okay, so Ryan and Ewan are taking damage from the swamps. I'm now playing, oh yeah, soul exchange. With soul exchange, you can sack creature to get back another creature. So I'm now doubting what to get back. Oh, I'm getting back my fallen angel. So what I can do is sack all my swamps to my fallen angel. I have a huge fallen angel. Oh, that's so funny. I think I attacked um, Ryan with the nightmare, by the way, because I see he's used his maze of it. So he's untapped my nightmare. Oh, man. This is so funny. It's looking really good for me now with the Cormus Bell. I'm just hoping that my opponents won't be able to like kill all my lands. Of course, that's a big risk because all my lands are now 1-1 one, one creatures. So if somebody has, for example, Earthquake for one, all my lands are gone. I mean, I'm taking a big risk here. But if I can untap with this, I don't understand why I didn't attack um, Daniel with the Nightmare. Perhaps I'm afraid that he's going to play his um, Swords on the Nightmare. 
But I mean, the source is going to be there regardless. So I just have to, to deal with it. I'm sorry here, by the way. I guess I'm a little bit too focused on my own board to actually see that Ewan's done quite a lot. He's played a Rocket Launcher and a Sorcerer's Queen, two really good cards. I think Rocket Launcher in this situation is really good because just for two mana, Ewan can kill one of my lands, right? Because Rocket Launcher 2, you can pay two and it can deal one damage to any target. Um, and then at the end, at the beginning of the end step, uh, it destroys itself. So you can use it multiple times. Anyway, let's uh, let's take a look. Let's see what Ryan's going to do. Recasting his Ring of Immortals that he got back the turn prior. I don't think that's going to matter much, Ryan. Passing turn. I mean, I, Ryan is still on 39, and he's got that Maze of If. So he's got some insurance. I wonder what's going to happen here. Tapping. There's a moat. Oh, no. A moat. Oh, this is horrible. Why, Daniel? Why? All my dreams and hopes shattered with that moat. Oh, at least I can still attack with Falling Angel and make it really big. I, I mean, I can't just attack Daniel with both creatures. And it looks like I haven't really noticed um, moat here. Because I'm trying to attack with my swamps. <laughs> no, I can't. There's a moat. Exactly, Daniel's pointing it out. Uh, I remember this. I thought that moat only counted for the player that cast it, but it's actually the whole table. So anyway, attacking now with both creatures going on to uh, to you in here. So it looks like I'm going to sacrifice some lands here to kill the bird. I think one land's not enough. I think I have to sack two lands. Exactly. Because it's plus two, plus one. So I was blocked by a 4-4 four, four flyer. So two swamps is about right. Now I'm playing a Throne of Bone. And of course it's Sorcerer's Queen still at Summoning Sickness, by the way, from, uh, from Ewan. So one card in hand. I'm still a little bit confused why I didn't attack Daniel. I think I should have just attacked Daniel with my both my flyers. I could have taken him out because he could have played a Swords on one of them. And then probably he would have done that on my Nightmare. And then it could have pumped up my Fallen Angel a lot if I wanted to. I had to probably put like seven, eight lands in or something. More even, nine. Anyway, oh, look at Ewan. Casting Wheel of Fortune. That is beautiful, man. That is beautiful. I'm still really nervous, by the way, because all my lands are one ones. In response, we see a Swords here from Daniel. And it looks like he's going to cast that. And there's a Shatter on Karma's Bell. There's a lot happening here. Shatter on Karma's Bell. Swords on my Nightmare. So I'm going to get tons and tons of life. That Nightmare does need to go. Oh, I'm losing my Oubliette. That Nightmare does need to go to. Oh, what else is he casting here? There's a Terror on Sir Chandelar. The Nightmare needs to be removed. And, okay, I'm gaining just a lot of life and using my Throne of Bone. Look at my life total. I'm on 46. This is not too bad. I've got a fresh pair of, uh, fresh hand. I still got a 3-3 three, three flyer. Th yeah, 3-3 three, three flyer. And I've got Uncle Istvan. I mean, life can be worse. Also for, you know, for you and things are looking pretty good. Using the Strip Mine here. Or not. Okay, no, he's not using the strip mine. For a moment there, I thought he used it. He's going to tap three. Oh, man. This is a good card. Force Field. So Force Field is a card that didn't get reprinted after Unlimited. So it's it's not very, very well known. But it's actually really good in the alpha beta formats. You can pay one. And then you only take one damage from uh, a creature. So if you attack with a 5-5 and you've got to take 5 damage, you can use Force Field. And you only take 1 damage instead of 5. So it's, it's really good. Let's see what Ryan can do here. Looks like he's casting his Xida again, his uh, commander. And okay, he's also playing a Birds of Paradise. And passing turn. And there we see Daniel Sand Silo slowly ticking up again. Oh, Library of Alexandria. Yeah, Daniel's really playing with some powerful spells today. Tapping a lot. What are we going to see here? 
There is, oh, cool, one of the Elder Dragons. Ah, oh, which one is this? This is the one that was kind of okay-ish with, uh, with the humans. Oh, man, I need I need to, it's Arcadus Sabbath, that's the name. And it gives it gives a bonus, doesn't it? It gives a uh, uh, plus O plus two. It's like a castle to the untapped creatures. Anyway, I'm taking my turn. You're playing Soul Ring, playing the Hive. So now I can start making giant wasp tokens, which is perfect timing, by the way, because I need to make my wasp tokens to block that huge Elder Dragon. So four cards in hand, and passing turn. Man, what a complex game this is. There we see a Stone Rain on the Library of Alexandria. Good move, Ewan. Because that would have netted Daniel a lot of cards. And what else is he going to do here? Playing Shiva Dragon. Wow. So cool. Another Shiva hitting the board. We're just seeing a lot of powerful creatures. And I guess with Ewan, I mean, he's got a maze. He's got a Sorcerer's Queen. He's got a, uh, a Force Field. And he's got a Sheevan Dragon. It's looking pretty good for him. And he can also recast his Aiden Oaken Shield. I'm sure there are quite a lot of creatures in his graveyard. I believe, actually, if Evictus Asmani is in his graveyard. So, ooh, it's it's looking pretty good for him. Uh, let's check on Ryan, by the way, because it's his turn. He's just cast his Sangir Vampire which is now one of the smaller flyers on the board. And now, of course, uh, Daniel's got to pay the upkeep cost for his Elder Dragon. And he's playing our Ar Givian Archaeologist. It's just a really good card. Like, he can pay two white and tap the Archaeologist, get an artifact back from his graveyard. For example, he could get back, um, he could get back the Nevin Earl's Disc. Playing a nice Wasp token, by the way. Got those from the, uh, the Lions from Venice. And playing a Banshee. Yeah, Banshee's really cool. Banshee um, can deal damage to any target, right? Tap and pay X. And then it deals half of that damage to target creature and half of that damage to me, I believe. Or just any target, by the way. But I'm on 50, so I've got a lot of life. So I can start using that Banshee to kill some creatures. That's actually kind of nice. Or just to deal direct damage. Ooh, Royal Assassin. Look at you and go, man. I think Banshee's gonna kill the Royal first. There we see him recasting Adun Oakenshield. Yeah, he needs more space. Still has the Rocket Launcher. I mean, chances are if I kill the Royal, he's gonna kill my Banshee with the Rocket Launcher, but who cares? Anyway, that's still a turn away. Let's see what Ewan can do here. Is he going to attack somebody? That's the question. I mean, he can. He's got... No, he's not doing it. I mean, he's got Sorcerer's Queen and Sheevan. He might as well just attack, but he's not. He's just passing turn to Ryan here. So Ryan on 39. Now he's going to go through his graveyard. That's not a good sign. Does he have an animate dead, perhaps? Okay, tapping for... Oh, he's going to cast House Caretaker. That's such a cool creature. Originally from Legends, this is a copy from Chronicles. During your upkeep, you can tap House Caretaker, sacrifice one of your creatures, and in return, you can bring back a creature from your graveyard right onto the battlefield. So, for example, he could sack his Birds of Paradise next turn, because you can only use it during the upkeep, and then he can get back whatever's in that graveyard. I've, I've got no clue what's in there. I've got no clue. But I'd probably a lot. And here we see Daniel also going through his graveyard, using his Argivian Archaeologist, getting back the Jam Day Tome here. So he's probably going to cast a Tome. And it looks like he's also played, uh, I call him Sinterklaas, Sage of Latnam. That's a 1-2 creature from the uh, Antiquities expansion. You can tap it, second artifact, draw a card. I'm making another Wasp token. Now I'm playing my own little storage land, of course, for black mana. Ah, what can I do here? I mean, it's probably best to just pass. Although, wait a minute, I've got to use my Banshee now to kill the Royal. Or do I really want to do that? I mean, Yoon can use the Royal 
to kill the archaeologist. It looks like I'm going to do something. Yeah, I'm going to use the Banshee. Am I going to... Maybe, maybe I'm making a little deal here with, with you and saying, you know, if you don't use your Royal or my Banshee, I will use Banshee to kill other creatures. No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I thought that for a moment. Anyway, um, I'm taking some damage from my own Banshee, but I'm also killing the Royal here. I, I think it's a good decision. I mean, you and you can get it back anyway with your, with your open shield. I'm, I'm now going to target um, the, the archaeologist. That's my next target, I think. And we see Ewan here checking his graveyard because of that Oaken Shield. So he's probably gonna get, uh, gonna get, I mean, he could get the Royal back or maybe just a bigger creature. I wonder if Ewan's gonna attack me just to retaliate for what I just did with my Banshee. He's going for his graveyard. Tapping three, taking back Dixita. That's a good decision. Can go for card draw. I get that. Gonna drop 33. Gonna cast uh Oh, also casting a Cabal Ghoul. So the Cabal Ghoul is actually gonna get a counter on there because a creature died. No, that was last turn that a creature died, of course. No, it's not gonna get a counter. That's unfortunate for the Cabal Ghoul. And it's now Ryan's turn, so he's going to untap. And now he can use his Hell's Caretaker, so he's going to sack the bo Bob, the Birds of Paradise. What is he going to take back here? I mean, there must be tons of stuff in his graveyard. Okay, actually going to get back a very modest, small creature. But it could be really good. The Scavenger Folk. Scavenger Folk, one green and sack, but you got to tap it to sack it. Destroys target artifact. Creature from the dark. Then we see a Taiga from Ryan here as well. I wonder what he wants to do with that. Does he want to blow up an artifact on the board here? Maybe the force field? There we see a Satch Troll. So Ryan is making some extra space here for all his creatures. Hmm, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how this is going to unfold. I mean, I'm actually at the highest life total on 52, which is kind of insane. And I'm just noticing, by the way, that Daniel is forgetting to pay for his Elder Dragon, but I guess, yeah, we're all forgetting it because nobody's mentioning it, so. Oh, well, it is what it is. You know, mistakes are made from time to time. We've been playing forever here. And again, he's tapping the Archaeologist and he's passing turn. I wonder, okay, making a wasp token here on the end step. So three giant wasp tokens. I wonder if I'm going to use my Banshee now to destroy the archaeologist. I mean, it's already done so much for Daniel. I couldn't really see what card he got back, by the way, last turn. Playing Barrel's Cage. Barrel's Cage, quite interesting. Um, you can pay a couple of mana, I believe two or no, three. And you can do it multiple times. You can target a creature every time, and, the tar and then the, the creature that you've targeted with the cage is not going to untap. So, for example, I could now pay three and keep the Argivian Archaeologist tapped. Looks like I'm doing that right. Okay, I'm going to keep the Adun Oaken Shield tapped here. Yeah, I'm using my Barrel's Cage to keep it tapped. And I'm also going to use it for the Archaeologist. Interesting, because I might I might as well use Banshee. I guess I could use Banshee in my end step to kill some creatures. Anyway, the Aiden Oaken Shield doesn't untap because of my barrel cage. Man, I'm just hoping for another Nevenor's disc, because I mean it's getting complicated again. There we see Ewan using his uh Xira to draw an extra card. Only got one card in hand, by the way. What can he do with that one card? And it looks like he's just passing turn to Ryan. Ryan's going to use his Exceda on the end step. And okay, now we see <laughs> this is so complicated. So now I'm using my Barrel's Cage to keep Exceda tapped of Ryan. 
Oh, because he did that on the end step. Oh, man. And the house caretaker didn't untap because I used my barrel skate on that as well. So my barrel skate is kind of dominating the board right now, which is kind of ridiculous. And it's making this game even more complex. There we see a rook egg being played by Ryan. I mean, I'm on the highest life, and I know how to stay alive, but how to win this, that's a whole different ball game. And the board is really gummed up right now. And it looks like Ryan's tapping quite a lot of mana here. What is he going to cast? Is he going to play an Elder Dra Oh, okay, he's going to play um, a Tetravus. So a 4-4 Flyer. And actually, 4-4 four, four Flyers are just not very impressive right now. If we look around what's all on the board, we've got some insane creatures. And actually, Ewan is still not really using his uh, Sorcerer's Queen, Ashivan Dragon combination. I mean, he could play a little bit more aggressive, I feel, since he's got the Force Field. But then again, I mean, it's kind of hard to find an opener. And passing turn here to Daniel. So his Archaeologist is not untapping because of my Barrel's Cage. There is, okay, a Tetravis on the side of Daniel as well. So now he also has that 4-4 flyer. Six cards in hand and passing turn to me. Am I going to do something on end step? I mean, I could use the Banshee. I could use the Barrel's Cage. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to use the Banshee. I'm finally going to kill the Archaeologist. Actually, oh, it's tapped, so it doesn't get the bonus from the Elder Dragon. So that makes sense. And I'm also going to use my Barrel's Cage to keep, yeah, the Eidun Oaken Shield tapped of Ewan. So you can see Ewan putting a counter on there. Thank you for that. And actually, Ewan, your, um, your Cabo Ghoul needs to be way, way bigger. Because there are so many creatures dying all the time. It's not a 2-2. I'm sure it should have been like a 5-5 by now. And using my Barrel's Cage and just passing turn here. So really counting my mana because it's so important for my Barrel's Cage and my Banshee. So my plan right now is just to keep the dangerous creatures tapped with the barrel's cage and slowly thin out the board with my Banshee. And Ewan just passing turn here. Still not doing much. Let's see what Ryan can do. And of course, Ryan like has a similar problem with all the creatures being... Oh, it looks like he's using his... Uh... Oh, he's going to kill my barrel's cage. That is a good move. With his scavenger folk, he just destroyed my barrel's cage. Man, that's a bit of a letdown. That is a good move here by Ryan. I don't, I actually don't blame you, Ryan. Barrel's cage is super annoying and, and it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing you took it away. So he's taking the counters off the Tetravus. So we've got three 1-1 one, one flyers, and of course the Tetravis itself is also a 1-1 one, one flyer. And that works really well with Hell's Caretaker, by the way. So one of the things he can do next turn is with his Caretaker, caretaker he can sack the original Tetravis, get another good creature back, maybe even the Scavenger Folk to destroy another artifact, and then he can sack one of the tokens to get the Tetravis back. So it's actually quite a nice combo. It's a slow combo. But it's pretty cool. Like Hell's Caretaker is really one of those cards that is very versatile, but slow. And you can only use it during the upkeep, right? But it's a cool card. So it's still Ryan's turn, it seems. And he's now past turn to Daniel here. I can see him drawing a card. He's using his Yamde Tome and his Jalen Tome. So he's also taking off the counters from his Tetravis. And he also has a combo with the Tetravis on the table because he's got Sage of Latnam, right? So he can now start sacking his 1-1 Flyers to draw cards and to maybe find a way out of this situation. I mean, not that he's under pressure, but he's also not winning. So, pretty sure that he wants to win. And now we can finally see the Cabo Ghoul ticking up. There is a Crumble. And what is he playing the Crumble on? Not quite sure. Maybe somebody wants to respond. Okay, he's playing Crumble on the Ring of Immortals. So Ring of Immortals is being used to protect it. And then there is a Dust to Dust. So now he can pick two targets. He's going to use the Tetravis. So it's removed from the game. And he's going to target the Force Field. Ooh, I think this is a good decision. 
This is, of course, good news for me because he's not targeting any artifacts of mine. And he's tapping a little bit more. Oh, there's an Aladdin's ring again. Aladdin's ring is back. So that's the artifact he got back with the Argivian archaeologist. It was the Aladdin's ring. Wow. And I'm sure I'm going to use Banshee now. Tapping, dealing two damage. What am I killing here? Yeah, I'm killing the house caretaker. That's of course another scary creature and I'm making another wasp token. So I now have four giant wasps. Thank you, Venetian lines. I mean, look at them, they look beautiful. Three cards in hand. I mean, the only thing that I've got going for me here is the Banshee. The Banshee is just huge. You know, or huge in the way that, oh, Pestilence! This is insane. Look at my life total. I'm on 50. Pestilence, one black, deals one damage to all the creatures and all the players on the table. So if I can pay enough black mana, I can kill everybody on the table. This is insane. This is absolutely insane. I mean, my opponents must be super nervous right now. It looks like I'm attacking. There is a berserk. Probably on my Fallen Angel. I wonder who I'm attacking. Perhaps I'm attacking Ryan here. We'll just have to wait and see. So a Berserk has been played on my Fallen Angel, so that's power has been doubled. That is now a 6-2 with Trample. Yeah, it looks like I'm attacking Ryan here, so Ryan's going to gobble up a Wasp token. So he's going to take 9 damage. And there we see a maze being used. Oh, a maze, of course, against the Fallen Angel. So he's only taking three damage. <laughs> That's like nothing. And my Angel dies to the Berserk, right? Am I missing something? I'm counting. And I'm playing just a huge Pestilence here. Or not? No, I'm not. It looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here, and I, I think I remember this part of the game because all of a sudden, I, you know, the, 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 when I cast that Pestilence, the whole situation changed, and all of a sudden I became a super favorite to win the game because my life total is so high. So I'm putting all my... Um, it looks like I'm putting... How much there? I can't read that dice, but it's got to be a ridiculously amount of mana there under my Pestilence. Probably enough to kill all the creatures on the board, if need be, to protect myself. Because, I mean, all the players are now going to try to kill me or get rid of the Pestilence. And if they can't, then they're going to try to kill me. Because they know, you know, as soon as they untap again, I've got the game in the bag. So this is quite an interesting moment in the game. And I'm now counting my lands again. I mean, Ewan is now going to try to find a way to attack. Try to find a way. I think I made a huge mistake attacking Ryan earlier. I should have just kept everything untapped. That wasn't necessary at all. But I guess, on the other hand, I guess I did that. Because it was like, I'm going to activate my Pestilence anyway. And wipe out all my creatures. But I think what's going to happen now is Ewan's going to attack me. He's going to force my hand. So it's going to force me to use the Pestilence. And I, of course, want to keep the Hive around so I can make a token. Because the thing is, with Pestilence, is it kills itself when there are no creatures at the end of a turn. Right? So if I kill all the creatures and I'm not able to make a new creature, I'm going to be toast. And now that I'm saying this, I'm realizing that Ryan has a Rook Egg in place. So that Rook Egg is actually going to help me. Because Ryan is going to get a 4-4 Flyer at the end of the turn, I'm, uh, I know that if I have to activate my Pestilence, um, it's not going to destroy itself. Actually, here we see Ewan helping me as well with another Rook Act. It's just more insurance for me. I'm not unhappy with this move by Ewan. And I'm just pointing out that I've got enough mana. I wonder what Ewan's going to do. He, he just has to attack me, right? He's got to force my hand here. If he attacks me with the Shivan, I'm going to use the Pestilence for 5. Maybe for more, even just wiping out all the creatures on the board. Because there are two Rook Eggs anyway, so I can just do that. 
Looks like Ewan's really in the tank right now, trying to find a way out. And I'm sure Ryan and Daniel are doing the same. I mean, this pestilence has changed the situation completely. The fact that I'm on 50 life and I've got pestilence, that's insane at this moment in the game. I mean, look at the amount of, of swamps that I have. I mean, I can do something really, really evil. And Ewan's like, I don't know what to do, man. What can I do? Maybe he's discussing it with the other guys at the table. He's really in the tank here. Trying to find an answer. So he's asking again, how much mana do you have? Under that pestilence. I think what I did is I made sure that under the pestilence, I have more than enough mana to kill all the creatures on the board. And I also have enough mana open to use my hive to then create a 1 1 giant wasp token so that my pestilence doesn't die. But I don't really have to because, you know, of those two rook eggs that are in the game. Okay, here we see an attack by the Shivan. In response, I'm using the pestilence. I don't have to tap the pestilence, by the way, but I guess I'm doing that to just show that I'm using it. And now, of course, we're going to see Daniel using his uh, Diamond Valley. So let's just kind of wait and see what's going to happen here. Oh, this is interesting. The Poltergeist can make an artifact into a creature so that the artifact's actually going to die to the Pestilence. That's actually kind of funny. So what is... Oh, this is so complicated. So it looks like Ryan is tapping and untapping stuff, but because he's going to regenerate the Uff control. And yeah, Daniel's going to sack his creature, so he's going to gain a lot of life because of the Elder Dragon that he sacked to the Diamond Valley. And yeah, and now we're going to see what's going to happen. So all the creatures are destroyed. I'm going to drop 39, so it wasn't 50, so I guess this was a Pestilence for 11. And now that all the smoke is cleared, we can kind of see the life totals again. So, Ryan is now on 21. Uh, sorry, uh, Ewan is on 21. Ryan's on 26. And Daniel is on 19. And I mean, I still have... I still have a lot of mana left, right? And I mean, they're getting their 4-4 flyers at the end of the turn. So that's some damage. But I can take that, that's okay. So a 4-4 flyer as well for Ryan. So Ryan can attack me with his 4-4 flyer and his 3-3 off control, which means that I'm going to drop to 32. And then Daniel can use his Aladdin's ring so he can drop me to 28 and then still have enough life. But it's going to be close. The thing is, if I use my Pestilence to protect myself from the attack of Ryan, I'm just going to kill my own Pestilence and I'll be dead anyway. So I think I just have to take the damage. He's going to attack me with 7. Of course, I can use my Pestilence for 3 if he's going to attack with the Sedge Troll. Um, so I'm going to take f damage. I'm going to go on to 35. Now I'm using the Pestilence for 2. That's interesting. So I'm on 33 right now. Oh, this is kind of scary. Daniel counting his mana. I mean, look at that sand silos. It's so full of beads. He's got so much mana there. So he's going to try to find an answer. I mean, a Tranquility can, can do it. Disenchant can do it. He just needs to get rid of the Pestilence, really. That's all. Wrath of God will do it as well. So he's going to use his Alan's Drink. So I'm going to drop to 29. Is this all that he can do here? Gonna draw an extra card. Oh, detention, detention, detention. And he's gonna pass turn. Okay, so I guess in my end step, I gotta use my Pestilence again for three. Looks like I'm just gonna use it for two though, dealing some extra damage. And now I think I have more than enough mana to win the game. So I remember this part very well. I was kind of like, okay, I don't want to make a mistake here. So I first went through my graveyard. I don't know why. And then I started counting my swamps, which I know why, because I want to check if I've got enough and I have more than enough. 
And then I could have just paid 22 mana and killed everybody on board. But instead, I started to think and rethink and think again. So now here I decide to draw 22, uh, sorry, pay 22 to kill everybody on board. But I decide to change my mind. I'm saying, sorry, guys, I first want to pay 15. I first want to kill the player who's lowest. That's Daniel. So I'm first going to kill Daniel. Here you see Daniel. Like, yep, yeah, finally dead, dude. Could have done it much sooner. Sorry for that. And then we see everybody going down in life, right? Ewan is on two. I'm on nine. Ryan's on seven. So actually, Ryan's really close to my life total. So, I mean, if these, like, if Ryan's got a lightning bolt, he can actually win it here. Uh, so now I'm going to kill Ewan. Now I'm going to go to seven. Ryan's on five. And now I'm going to kill Ryan. So I'm not kind of hoping that Ryan doesn't have that lightning bolt. And he's actually casting a Fisher, <laughs> taking away my Urborg, because he said, I'm, I blame your Urborg for this. Anyway, I got this, man. I got the game. Oh, fantastic. It doesn't happen a lot that you win these games because they're just so complex. Oh, man, this was so much fun. And I think it really shows how powerful and exciting it can be to play with mono black. You know, there are just so many interesting cards in black. And when you go for one color, I guess it counts for any color and you play commander with it. Um, you know, you're building a hundred card deck, so you can really go in depth into the old school card pool. And what I also like is at certain point, you're like, what cards do I actually have of this color? And you start to play with cards that you usually never use. Um, you know, we, we, I think we saw a lot of cards in this game that are very underpresented in old school magic. And in this format and in any multiplayer format, they get a chance to shine. I mean, the same goes for the Highlander format or you know, just, just regular 100 card decks, what we used to play with. Those are fun as well. So anyway, um, yeah, great game. I just want to thank, of course, you and AKA Sumpcommon for the match. I want to thank Ryan, AKA Cornhole for the match. I want to thank Daniel, AKA Free Range Chicken for the match. Thank you guys, man. It was great. Remember, I fast forwarded this match times two so in reality uh this actually took three hours more than three hours to play this game so uh yeah that was kind of insane but it was a lot of fun if you enjoyed this game as much as i did please let me know in the comments below as a matter of fact if you want to support the channel first of all you already did by watching this video thank you so much let me know if you've watched it in one go or you probably watched it in you know in steps, right? But it's, it's pretty cool if you watched it in one go. I would love to hear from you if you did. Um, but what, oh yeah, what did I want to say? I wanted to say that if you enjoyed it, um, please help the channel out. And it's actually quite easy. You can do three easy steps. You can like this video, you can leave a comment, and you can share this video on your socials. All those things are free and they're really helping the channel grow and helping kind of supporting me as a content creator. Another thing that you can do if you're new here, welcome. I'm really happy that you found Timmy Talks is you can subscribe and ring that bell. Yeah, let's do it. You know, help the channel grow. Oh man, it's just so much fun. I'm just so happy that I've, I've won this, this match. I didn't see that coming. I guess my life total was really high the entire game. Maybe that was part of the success. And of course, luck, a lot of luck. Anyway, uh, last but not least, the last thing I want to share with you before we go to the end scroll to, and look at the Timmy crew, I would like to tell you that there's one final thing that you can do, and that is that you can become a sponsor of the channel by joining Patreon and becoming a patron of Timmy Talks. And uh, that already starts with $1 a month, and then you're helping me as a content creator keep doing what I love to do, and that is making Magic the Gathering old school videos for you guys. So you can just uh, do that by um, going to patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. There's probably an info card that's popping up right now. You can click on that info card and that will take you to the Timmy Talks website. So please have a look if you think it's something for you. And the cool thing is if you do, you can actually join our EDH monthly um, games that we have going for us on our uh, Discord server. And also your name will be added to the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. Let's go and have a look at our amazing, fantastic, wunderbar patrons and channel members. Let's have a look at the Timmy crew. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Ik het was fikker te somber gezien.